Hi there, and welcome to week three's lecture on the financial services, customer relationships and complaints procedures. So far in this module, we've looked at what is regulation. We've looked at who the regulators are from a UK point of view. And then we've also looked at how regulators authorise individuals and firms to operate within the banking sector. And now in week three, we're going to go on to look at how professionals within the financial services sector that are regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority provide advice or help to clients and the rules and principles surrounding this relationship. More specifically, we're going to understand the different types of risk factors on certain products and how finance professionals must communicate the, these levels of risks to their customers and help the customers understand their own risk tolerance. We're also going to look at various diff different products which customers may seek advice on and point out the risks associated with each product. And then in the second part of this lecture, we're going to look at the complaints procedure that customers we may wish to follow in the form of a grievance and then the rules surrounding compensation if this complaint is upheld. Then finally, we're going to look at the whistle blowing process, which is an internal policy where an employee of the firm may whistle blow on, on something that's not being conducted in the right manner or breaking regulation. And this is obviously done in the best interests of the business, but it's really from an internal employee following a process to point out something wrong from another potential employee or a manager that's going against regulations. And we'll look at the protections in place for the employee that is a whistleblower. So firstly, before we look at anything, in the UK, the best way of preventing any sort of complaint or break in regulation when it comes to customers is the concept of know your customer, KYC. Companies within the financial sector have to do their best to know their customer before they do any sort of business with them. So if you think from a bank account point of view, when you open a bank account, okay, it might be an online process, but in that process, they still want to get to know you. So they might obviously ask for your address. They might ask for ID. In some cases, they might call you to check up who you are. They might also do a credit check on your history. And this is all designed to make sure that you are who you say you are. For larger institutions, it's hardly likely that they're going to know you, you as a person. But at least they know that you are a le legitimate person. And that's key because if they know their customer and their customer is legit and honest, then the likelihood of you as the customer committing fraud or going through money laundering or anything like that is reduced significantly if the bank knows their customer. So the first example we're going to go through in the customer relationships process is when advising on credit. So this could be on a loan, but the example we're going to use is during the mortgage advisory process, which is a bit more detailed than a loan application. So the first aspect is surrounding budgeting. So if a client goes to a financial firm to receive credit, then you as a financial advisor would need to do what's known as a fact find. And this is a series of questioning. If it's online, it could be a long form, but most advisory done face to face or over the telephone. The first aspect after know your customer is a whole fact find. And you would go through pretty much everything, certainly in the form of a mortgage. So you would go through their income and expenditure. Income, you'd obviously want detailed information on the likes of salaries. Um, if they're retired, we'd look at the likes of pensions. 
but also second income, household income if you rent out property, and other sort of investment income. Now at this stage, this is not something you would need to evidence as a customer, but this process is done on utmost good faith in the fact that your customer is giving you the most accurate information. And then, after knowing their income, you'd assess their expenditure. So, do they already have mortgage debt that they pay out? Do they have uh, high bills? Do they have other consumer credit? Do they have balances on credit cards? And once the financial advisor has all this information, then they can work out what is your leftover disposable income or in cases of credit consolidation, understand the level of debt we're dealing with. So following this fact find, and you have a scale of whatever the disposable income is, or the level of debt the client has, this is where you can start to take action and give advice. Now, depending on what advisor you're speaking to, also kind of depends on the level of advice they can give. So you wouldn't expect a mortgage advisor to give you advice when it comes to the likes of bankruptcy proceedings or debt consolidation. So if your advisor is good and proper and they realize they can't give you advice on the issue you're facing, they have to be honest and say, I'm sorry, this is not our area of expertise. And then point the client in the right direction where they're going to seek appropriate advice. The last thing you want is someone to give advice when they really do not know the subject they're dealing with. But from a regulatory point of view, we've made it quite simple. If your customer is struggling with their finances and there's clearly a shortfall, then if you're an appropriate advisor, Your role is to help them to reduce their expenditure, and that could be through debt consolidation. But it's not your role to tell them how to live their life and what kind of discretionary spending they do. You can't tell them to reduce that. You can advise it, but the last thing you can say is, see that sky package you're paying for, do you really need it? Do you really need that season ticket? As a financial advisor, that's not your role. You can obviously just point out the cost of it and let the customer make the decision, but you can't tell them how to live their life. Your role is purely look at their finances and think, well, actually, you've got so much on this credit card. We can look to consolidate that with this, which will just reduce your bills for this expenditure. In the case of where customers have a surplus, then it's not your role to say, right, let's make very good use of this surplus. It's your role to go to the customer and say, how would you like this surplus to be dealt with? What goals are you seeking for? Are you looking to generate extra wealth? Or are you just looking to have that safely stored for your future legacy? It's not your role to make that decision for them. It's to give them the options and then advise them depending on their financial goal. So let's go back to the example of providing advice when it comes to credit. Now, this could be to simply get a loan for the likes of a car or a holiday. But this example I'm going to follow is in the process of buying a house, which is one of the biggest forms of credit an individual will ever apply for. And in the mortgage uh, advisory sector, there's really three types of advice that you can give. Now, this could be to get a mortgage, first of all, to buy a house. This could also be to remortgage when you currently own a property and then when you want to switch products. And there's also the buy to let mortgage sector, which would be advice on the mortgages you can provide to investors if they're buying a property to rent out. But this example, I'm going to just go through the house buying process and if you're just to get a mortgage for a new property. But the same principles do apply when you're looking to remortgage later on and you already own the property, but you're simply trying to lower the interest rate potentially on your product because you have more equity or loan to value in the property. So at this stage, we're assuming that the advisor has done the fact find process. 
so it gets a full understanding of the customer's affordability. Also, during this fact find, the advisor asks the customer what type of mortgage would they want, whether that being a fixed rate mortgage, where the interest, rate, interest rates are set at a fixed amount for a certain period, or if the customer wants to have a variable rate. Now, it's not the advisor's role to say which one they should have, and the advisor should never speculate on future interest rate movements. As an advisor, what you would potentially suggest is the advantages and disadvantages of both. So when it comes to fixed mortgages, we can say this will be your fixed payment for a set number of years. Therefore, you're able to budget around this rate, knowing that this cost won't change until the fixed term period ends. And it's up to the customer to choose what type of fixed deal they want, whether that be for two years fixed, three years, five even some cases at the moment, 10 years. If your client wants to talk about being on a variable rate, where the interest payments or interest rate can change month by month, it's the role of the advisor to explain mathematically how this may impact their monthly payments. So they can do a scenario to say if interest rates go up by 1%, therefore your mortgage cost will go up by X. And so let that customer understand the risk they're potentially facing and to see if their budget following the fact find will allow this interest rate increase, or how that might impact their finances if it is a substantial increase in interest rate. And in some mortgage products, there is something called an offset product. So if a customer has a, a large amount of savings, there are certain products where the could potentially offset the interest paid on a savings pot, so they would receive no interest on the savings, but it would lower the interest rate on their mortgage. So it's potentially the role of the advisor to explain how this product worked, and it may suit clients with large savings, specifically when interest rates are very low. But like I said, it's then up to the client to decide if they're to go fixed or floating rates. It's not the advisor's role to make that decision for them. And quite a lot of these rules and regulations really came from the mortgage market review in 2009, 2010. And this was really following the financial crisis, where before this, the affordability tests, or the budget, we'll say, prior to the financial crisis, was really not up to the standard it should be and some clients were receiving mortgages they simply could not afford. So following this review of the market, the rules regarding affordability were very heavily tightened up, specifically around expenditure. So advisors would have to take more impetus on the likes of child costs. Even in the fact find now, we ask about the likes of your transport costs for commuting. If you drive a car, what's the fuel consumption? They might also ask the likes of council tax limits in the area or the potential council tax you will end up paying at the new property. What are your energy bills forecasted to be? So all of these expenditures questions are now within the affordability checks. When it comes to income, before this uh, mortgage market review, we had something called self-certification mortgages, where if you earned a certain amount, then the bank wouldn't potentially check on your income. But now, self-cert mortgages don't really exist. You always have to provide evidence via like sort of a pay slip for your income. And there was also further in rules regarding uh, buy-to-let mortgages for when you uh, rent out to buy. So you, you use your former or current rent income to buy the next property. Then rules have also been tightened up. Critics may say this has made consumers face a much greater challenge when getting credit or, or really making it harder for people to get on the housing ladder. But the regulators will say, well, this is maybe true However, is it not more financially prudent to allow 
only people that can afford the mortgage to have mortgages. Because of what we've seen during the financial crisis, there was a heavily amount of repossessions due to people who simply couldn't afford their mortgage anymore and they lost their jobs. So it's a trade-off between giving access to this product and financial prudence. But what the regulators also included within the affordability tests is the level of the deposit. So if you had a lower deposit, then the affordability rules would be much stricter. Because with lower deposits, that means your interest rate is probably going to be higher. But if you had a larger deposit, then the affordability check wouldn't have to be as stringent. But again, this is good financial prudence. If your customer is putting a lower deposit down, you want to ensure that they can afford the mortgage because in the event of repossession, the bank might inherit a house that doesn't have much equity in it. So to establish this, we use the loan to value ratio or LTV, which is a simple ratio between the amount of deposit you're putting down and the house price that you're going to purchase the property at. There is an example on the screen here, but an easier example is if the house price is 100,000 and you're borrowing 80,000, so you're putting a 20k deposit down, then clearly that's an 80% LTV. In the uh, mortgage market, we would consider a loan to value of above 90% as high and then something like 80 or below as a lower LTV. LTV. So you would say about an 85% is somewhere in the middle, a medium LTV. But prior to the mortgage market review, some financial in institutions like Northern Rock were issuing loans of 120% loan to value. That's essentially saying you can have your house for free plus another 20% to do it up. And that means the customer doesn't need to put any deposit down. Now the logic behind this at the time was that house prices are increasing rapidly. So if you issued a loan at 120%, if they then went and did the property up, then the property value would go up even further than the rates the property values were increasing at the time. Therefore, the 120% loan to value would lower very quickly to under 100% loan to value because the property value shot up. So therefore, your customer would not be in what's known as negative equity. Now, this product does sound good if interest, sorry, if house prices are rising. However, if the house prices fall, which we've seen happen, then your 120% loan to value mortgage starts to become 140%. And this is where you are in serious negative equity. Negative equity means the loan you've got is more than the house value. Therefore, in the event of repossession, if the bank takes over the property, then if they sell it, they're going to make a massive loss on what the debt that they issued in the first place was. And if you're a customer and you're in negative equity, but you're, you're not in a bankruptcy situation, you can still pay the mortgage. This just means you're paying for a mortgage more than the property value. So you're paying a lot more than you should. And it will take a long time for you to potentially get into positive equity. So that could mean you might be stuck with the same provider for a long time because other banks, certainly now, would not lend in the case of neg negative equity. So I'll let you do an example right now to work out the loan to value ratio on this house purchase with the property price being 124500 with a deposit of 20000 what is the loan to value ratio of this transaction? And also try to consider is the answer a high loan to value, a low loan to value, or is it somewhere in the middle? And what type of mortgage products would they be able to receive if this was the case? The answer will be provided in the notes section to this slide. Okay. Let's move away now from credit advice 
and we'll look at the advice surrounding savings and investments. Now, first thing to notice is saving and investment are two very different things. Saving is something where we look to products where we simply maintain the level of wealth that you have and ensure that it is there and secure for the longer term. But investments is something where we'd expect that your assets can be used to try and generate additional wealth for yourself. If we look at it from a risk point of view, savings is a very risk conservative or risk averse approach. Investments is taking that next step to potentially take on a little bit more risk in the return for some additional reward. But from an advisory point of view, this comes back to the likes of financial goal setting. What is your goal? Do you want to just maintain your wealth or do you want your wealth to grow? Are we looking for short term needs or are we looking for longer term needs? And this is if you're the advisor, this is the sort of goals uh, that you need to obtain in order to advise your client whether they should just simply be saving or whether they should put their capital at risk in the term of investment over a longer period. So we've got two examples here, obviously kind of short term needs. The likelihood of you making an investment over a short period is rather low because that could form the character of likes of trading. So over short term goals we tend to save for, but for longer term goals, the likes of retirement or university fees for children, this is where you potentially look to invest uh, your, your wealth. So uh, as an advisor over the short term, you might be faced with the question is how can you help your clients save or how much can they save? Again, this comes back to the first thing of knowing your customer and doing the, red, the uh, budgeting. And this is where you would really focus on the disposable income side and look at some of their financial expenditure to see if they can help from a finance point of view. Again, you're not telling them how to live their lives. You can't do that as, an, as advisors. So you might be able to help them lower their expenditure on potential debt products. If it's a mortgage, you can help them remortgage to a cheaper rate. You could look to consolidate debt into one lump sum loan, for instance, and then that could potentially help reduce their expenditure and this expenditure reduction could then be used to save. In some cases, there might not really be an opportunity to save that much. Therefore, it's really trying to get your customer into a habit of putting away a little but often. So potentially showing how this is feasible or looking for products that are designed for small sums that build up and potentially reward you for doing so. And if an advisor does this correctly, and then they help their client to save, then the likelihood of your customer returning in the future when they have additional wealth, then they could eventually turn this kind of savings advice later on to some sort of investment advice. And again, this would help you as a customer, but from a advisor point of view, that's good to show that you have a good positive relationship and that you're providing the right services and help to your client. And it also helps obviously for your customer attention as well. As an advisor of savings products, the number of risks that you have to explain to your customer isn't really about obviously the, your capital being at risk, uh, as long as it's under the subject of a de uh, deposit uh, scheme where your deposits are protected. It's more about the kind of levels of access. And if you do access your finances uh, or your savings pot, potentially explain some of the uh, interest rates that they may be sacrificing if they have to uh, withdraw cash, um, which violates kind of the product you put it in. So it's really just explaining how the product works and when the interest payments will be received and any sort of penalties if you withdraw early, for instance. So that's the kind of a risk advice you would be given to your clients. It's really about the product's risks, not the risks of their capital. Let's have a look now at the kind of attitudes of risk 
when it comes to investing now. So when a customer is kind of got their savings pot or they've got their or their emergency funds will say, then we can potentially look to give them advice on investing. Now there isn't really a written rule of principle about what constitutes as an emergency pot or as a level of savings before you look to invest. But it is good financial prudence that some advisors would suggest if you were to lose your job, would you be able to survive for three to six months on your savings? So you might want to try and build up a certain security net that would pro at least provide you with enough money if you were to potentially lower your income significantly for a period of three to six months. So we kind of use that as kind of a, a benchmark to say this is how much you should potentially have saved before looking to take on any additional risk. Because when we take on additional risk with the likes of investments, there's a range of other things we need to consider and what advisors need to inform the client, whether that be via speech or whether that be in writing. So here are a few of the terminologies that you must in tell your customer they could face in any sort of investment. The main one here is being capital. If you're going to invest a certain amount, there is a chance you may lose it all. Obviously, if you're an advisor, uh, and you're an investment advisor, the last thing you want to do is lose all your clients money. So you need to explain that if you are investing, there is a chance you could lose your money and what kind of uh, situation would that leave you into. You also need to explain, now this is your financial target, but there is a risk. We may never actually get to that financial target. Therefore, what's the backup plan if we don't hit this target? Is the target in the first place actually reachable in the first place? We also have to potentially explain that interest rate risk depend on the product, if it's the likes of a debt product, a bond product that you're investing in, how interest rate changes can impact the level or the price of this product and the interest you receive. And in some cases, it may be more beneficial to simply save rather than invest. And lastly, we need to talk about the likes of inflation risk. And this is where average price rises in the economy can actually lower the level of your purchase and power or lower your actual real investment income. But inflation risk tends to be more prevalent on savings products because savings products, the interest rate is closer to the level of inflation than investment products usually. But there's also other things to consider when investing, advising clients on investments. And this is actually about the circumstances and the beliefs of your client. What are the client's ethical preferences? Now, some might not have any, might not, might, might not have any, uh, think, oh, just invest in anything. I'm really, I, I don't see it from that point of view. But of course, some clients may have certain religious beliefs. Uh, some clients might have certain um, views on the environment. And these things all need to be taken into consideration when advising clients or managing clients' money for them. Because the last thing you want to do is invest potentially your clients' money in products that really go against their ethical beliefs that will be a big breach of trust and then the customer could claim that you don't really care about them and the way, their way of life and then you could lose that customer or could end up going down the complaints route and there's two ways of doing this there's kind of positive screening or negative screening so you could ask your customer are these do they want to look into certain companies so your customer might say i only want to invest in this top sort of company that, that operates in a certain way. Or there's the negative route where the customer says, I simply do not want my money invested in X, Y, and Z. So this is where you can potentially 
start a conversation and saying, is there any areas where you'd like to invest or simply would not want to invest from an ethical point of view? And there is plenty of research out there into are ethical stocks, do they perform better than the likes of SIN stocks? And at the moment, the evidence is inconclusive. But the theory behind an ethical organisation is that these should, over the long term, be more sustainable and provide a more sustainable growth when it comes to returns. As the likes of SIN stocks may potentially not be seen as sustainable in the longer term and therefore over a longer horizon their returns will start to drop is the logic behind that. Now going back to the levels of risk tolerance so when we understand when we've explained the, the types of risks your customer could face, when we've looked at potential ethical preferences of your customer, the most one of the most important things is how much level of risk overall is your customer willing to take? Are they a risk averse person, therefore they want to invest but only in products that are relatively safe? Or are they a bit more loose and a bit more risk aggressive, therefore they don't really mind too much at the levels of capital risk in the hope that they will be rewarded appropriately with a higher return. And this can be found out by asking your customer a series of questions. You could also potentially run them through a risk tolerance test which would potentially work out their risk appetite. But there's also other factors to consider and that would be the likes of their stage of life, uh, their age. Historically, younger people are willing to take on excess risk because we can say that they have a longer time in the event of any loss for this, this uh, loss to be recouped. But the last thing we want to see is someone that's about to take, take retirement put their pension at excess risk because if that excess risk results in a loss, then they're about to retire and that product's due to end. And unfortunately, we've seen this during the financial crisis where a number of pensions took excess risk close to retirement age. And when the clients retired, their pension fund was significantly lower than they were expected due to the losses during the financial crisis. And there's this sort of a uh, thing we want to avoid moving forward, of course. And as, as an advisor, we should also explain to our customers the concept of mental accounting. So some customers might have different risk tolerance depending on their different products. So they may have a savings pot, which, you know, savings is low risk, but then they might put some money aside. That's kind of a medium risk. Then they might put some other money aside, take excess risk or even gamble. Obviously, gambling is not from the financial service sector. That's just gambling sector. So we need to explain to our client that well, actually your assets is one big portfolio and that you mentally assign different sums to have different levels of risk and kind of talk that through with them as well and how we can try to avoid the likes of mental accounting which could lead to irrational decision making. Say if one pot suffers a heavy loss then you might try and use the other pot to take excess risk in that which goes against the way they set up their pots in the first place. So let's look at some other products now. So let's look at uh, products which protect our clients in the form of some sort of insurance or payment protection if they were to potentially lose their job or have long-term sickness. So as a advisor, certainly when it comes to mortgage advisory, you might advise this whole mortgage, which is a, a large uh, financial commitment but then you also need to go well you've, you've took on this large product what happens if you lose your job how will you keep paying for that product what if you become critically ill how can you then pay off your mortgage payments so this is where we need to explain to our clients the likes of uh, critical illness policies and life insurance policies, which we'll get onto shortly. But there's also something called payment protection insurance, acronymed to PPI. 
And you've probably seen that in the news for many years, because prior to the financial crisis, this was missold, or in some cases, it was simply added on to people's mortgage payments, and they didn't know they had this PPI policy, because it was either not told or missold. And therefore, all the compensations were against paying for this product that they didn't even know they had and never really potentially needed. So there is a whole kind of sector devoted to financial products in the event of where things go wrong. And that's what we'll talk about very shortly. And as well as this, we also have kind of retirement planning. So talking about when you finish your career, what sort of pension pot do you require uh, in the UK? The recent governments have stipulated that everyone must have a work-based pension and that they cannot rely solely on the state pension. So there's a whole sector devoted to retirement planning and pension advisory. But the problem with this sector is it is better to start off at a younger age to build up that sort of protection retirement plan. But when people are in their 20s and 30s, the last thing they're thinking about is retirement. So it's quite difficult for this sector to really get clients in at the age they probably should start. And what we've seen is people start doing their retirement plan and later, and then they're not able to build up a certain pension pot to fulfill their future life ambitions. But the likes of the UK government have tried to combat this in recent years by putting everyone on a workplace pension and giving incentives to the retirement uh, financial services sector to attract customers at a younger age to help plan for the future. So let's go back and have a look at the uh, sorts of protections in place in the event of unfortunate death or critical illness. Um, and these policies are not requirements for mortgages. So you don't have to take out a protection policy if you take out a mortgage. But under KYC and treating customers fairly, which we'll also get to next week, you must inform clients of products that are available in the event of critical illness or death. Because the last thing you want if you are to unfortunately die is to leave all your debt to your estate or to your relatives to pick up. So typically, when you purchase a mortgage, then it would be good financial prudence of yourself to take on a life insurance policy, or at least a, pol a life insurance policy that lasts, it could be a term one, that follows the length of the mortgage. For instance, myself, I took out a 25-year mortgage I also then took out a critical illness policy for 25 years and a life insurance policy for 25 years. Now, obviously, I do, want, I do not want these policies to ever pay out because I'll either have a critical illness or I'll, I'll be dead. But I also don't want my cat Pablo to pick up the bill when I die. Okay, maybe my, my, my family, but you get the point. I have this big debt that I have to pay for myself. The last thing I want to do is leave it to my family. And I used to be a mortgage advisor myself. And one thing that was difficult would be even having this conversation. If you're an advisor giving advice to someone buying a mortgage in their 20s or 30s, and they're really excited about buying their first home, the last thing they want to be talking is about the potential debt or critical illness. But as an advisor, we kind of have to. And we have to tell them these risks and make them think about this consequence, but also provide the benefits of having this policy. And typically, if you take out these likes of policies at a younger age, they're cheaper. I'll give you an example from myself. I have a life insurance policy that will pay out in the event of death which cover the mortgage and some more, and it's fixed term. And I pay, I think, £5 a month or something for that. I don't even, I can't even remember what I pay, it just comes out every month. 
Think about how much your mo how much your mobile phone bill is, or if you've got mobile phone insurance protection policy. If your mobile phone breaks, that's probably like 20, 30 quid a month. Yeah, I'm insured to a hundred thousand plus for five pound a month. So if you put in that sort of context, then it is a bit more understanding, and customers are more willing to have the conversation. If it's a critical illness, then this is a bit more of an expensive product. So I think I pay about twenty pound a month for critical illness policy. So I know if I become critically ill, um, which there's obviously broad, re, broad, broad definitions on what critically ill means. But the idea is if you're critically ill, the likelihood of you being off work for a long period or you might have to pay for life changing circumstances, um, then having this critical illness policy would pay out again, probably to the sum of the mortgage and a little bit more. So you could potentially wipe out the debt you have, but also help maintain the level of life that you would then go on to have. So again, £20 a month for that is something I'm willing to pay. But obviously your advisor will have will also understand your current affordability from the affordability checks to help you explain the potential long-term costs of these policies. But saying that, if you're advising an, an elderly client, then life insurance policies and critical illness policies do shoot up shoot up in cost substantially with age or uh, health and lifestyle um, factors. But these conversations are also very important if your client has children, and then you might also need to point them in the right direction to come to advice as such as creating wills and uh, inheritance tax planning. And lastly, for this part, there's also protections in place for businesses. Now, we'll cover insurance in week seven, but there is certain policies where it, where businesses can insure their key personnel. So potentially people at the top of the organization, if, you're, if they were potentially lost for whatever reason, then that could severely impact the business. You might also have seen things on the TV, the likes of uh, chief tasters at coffee roasting houses um, might ensure their tongue because their whole product is based on taste. Therefore, they have experts or they might have someone that's worked for the company for a very long time that tests every batch of coffee and therefore their tongue is vitally important to your business and the quality of your product so people can actually get that insured. Uh, surgeons, some surgeons obviously they need their hands. Um, interestingly, when I go back to the example before of critical illness policies, if you have certain jobs your critical illness policy could be much higher. So the example I've just given you there is a surgeon. Amputation falls under a critical illness policy so in the event of amputation your policy may pay out but if you're a surgeon there may be exemptions and it may not pay out so there's also that sort of thing you need to explain to your client depending on their actual job role what are the exemptions of the policy when will they not pay out therefore the likes of a business or in the medical profession they may insure certain people, the likes of a surgeon, because if they're lost due to like an amputee where they can't really use their hands anymore, then insurance policies could pay out for the business to reskill or to buy new technology or to reemploy someone else. So there is a vast array of these products that do exist, but your role as an, as, as an advisor to someone buying these products is to make them fully informed of the payment schedule, the risks involved, and the exemptions in the event of payout. And this concludes part one of this lecture. Hello there, and welcome to the second part of week's free lecture on the customer relationship and complaints procedure within the financial services sector. In this second and final part, we're going to talk about 
when things go potentially wrong and the customers want to complain or whether you're an employee within a firm where you see an act of wrongdoing and you want to do a whistleblowing process. So in the first part, we covered a range of different things that the likes of a financial services advisor has to inform their customer. And if you do not provide a sufficient service, or if you give out wrong advice, or if you weren't qualified for advice in the first place, this could result in a customer complaint. So now let's explain what businesses within the financial services sector have to do in the event of a complaint and the processes customers will face when going through the complaints process. So what is a complaint? Well, I'll let you decide that, but I'll tell you from a kind of banking finances point of view what a complaint should look like. Nowadays, when someone wants to complain, where do they go? Tend to get Twitter open and have a bit of a rant. Well, unfortunately, that's not a complaint. Um, if you go on and complain to someone on Twitter, which most people tend to do these days, you'll probably get a message saying sorry and all this uh, from their PR department and say contact this number or drop us a DM or something. But really, what they're doing is just trying to manage the reputational damage because that's not a complaint and it is a complaint procedure to follow. So the first thing that any firm, uh, certainly within the financial services sector, must have, they must have a written policy of how they deal with complaints. And in this policy, they must also stipulate who is eligible for making a complaint because we'll go on to cover this, who is eligible and who's not. But the FCA have, def have defined what a complaint should be. As we covered in week one, the FCA have their own statutory power to create rules and enforce them. So they said that any complaint has to be oral or written, an expression of dissatisfaction, and so on. You can read the quote there. So the key bits there is oral or written. Now, yes, Twitter is written, but it's not really the right communication channel. So normally you would go through comp complaints procedure. If it's a bank, you might go to their website and you might fill in a complaint form. You might go in branch, fill in a complaint form, or you might call them up and you might do a complaint orally. Or in branch, you might go and complain orally as well. If you do complain orally, then the person at the other side of the phone or the other side of the desk, then they're effectively writing down the complaint as you've described it. And then normally they would show you or read it back to you so you can confirm. So even though it's an oral complaint, typically if it's a phone call it will be recorded anyway, but the person at the other end of the phone will be making a note of the complaint and read it back to you. So I've said you shouldn't really go to Twitter to complain. So what is the complaints process? In the notes to this uh, slide, I've put a link there from the FCA's guidance on complaints procedure. But really, it takes a couple of steps. And there's also a timeline involved as well. So to start with, you may see adverts on the TV or uh, online of um, professional complaint um, services and they will say that they'll do a swift complaint for you and get you the relevant compensation and what have you. Um, now they're just a, a service. Technically they're not needed and you can do and should do uh, the complaint on your own behalf um, and follow the, the, this process because if you use a complaint company chances are they're going to take a fee from whatever compensation you receive. Um, so the first thing is to complain directly yourself. So whatever the complaint is, uh, go, direct, go direct to the, the organization's website, read their complaints policy, um, and the best way of making or raising a complaint. So you have to uh, do it yourself, 
whether that be written or orally. So then make the complaint direct to that business. And then what? Well, under the rules of the Financial Ombudsman Service, the organisation has eight weeks to deal with your complaint. So within that eight weeks, the organisation should acknowledge the complaint, first of all, and then come to some sort of judgment and a decision on what to do about the complaint. And if they don't do this within eight weeks, or you are unsatisfied with outcome on the complaint, this is when you can go to the independent body and contact the Financial Ombudsman Service, and they're an independent body who will look at the complaint and look at how the complaint was handled, and then potentially uphold the complaint or overturn it. And if they overturn it, they obviously inform the firm of the correct, correct method of resolving the complaint. Now, if you feel that the outcome from the Financial Ombudsman Service is incorrect, then this is when you would really go to the next and last stage of going through the civil claims uh, legal process. And this is where you might get the likes of a solicitor involved. So, who is actually eligible to make a complaint? Well, you're probably sitting there and going, and you're thinking, well, everybody, surely. Um, and obviously, the, the, these rules, again, these are set up by the Financial Ombudsman Service, um, in line with the FCA, and an eligible complainant pretty much is everybody, except from large firms. So you can see here that anyone can really complain if they're a customer, a small business, um, but there's obviously stipulations on how much that business can earn. Because if the complaints are of a certain nature and a certain size, and it's more of a commercial complaint, then really this would be go would go straight down the civil uh, civil law uh, pursuit with the solicitor. So really, customers, small businesses, small charities, and trusts are all eligible to complain through this process. But anyone bigger is really going to be going through the kind of civil law process involving solicitors and civil claims courts, and obviously potentially criminal courts, depending on what the complaint actually is. Um, but it's also worth noting that the person you're complaining to has to all also be an authorised professional firm or by the Financial Conduct Authority. So if you're complaining to a financial company that's not actually regulated by the FCA, then the don't have to follow this complaints procedure. So you would have to work out who regulates said firm and how potentially you can complain and what is the process. But obviously, from a business point of view, you don't really want to have any complaints. Um, you probably think no news is good news. We're not getting complaints, so that must be good. Um, well, not necessarily. Even if you don't have any complaints or you're, you don't get many, you still have to uh, follow the principles of good business, specifically the customer's interest ones of treating every customer fairly, TCF, and obviously uphold uh, certain ethical standards when it comes to operating on behalf of your customers. And that whatever you do, whether that be advisory, or provide a service, then you're doing it in an integrity and ethical way that you're doing it in the interest of the customer rather than the interest of yourself. So when I was a mortgage advisor, uh, there was the process I mentioned before where you'd go through the mortgage process, but then you'd have to talk to them about critical illness and life insurance policies. And it was a must. Now a cynic might go, uh, they've sold me the mortgage. Now they tell me to sell the, int the uh, insurance policy because the interest, the insurance policy, makes more money for the firm. Um, that is a cynical view, and I have to be honest, as an advisor, I also thought kind of thought that as well. But actually, it is a requirement uh, to treat everybody fairly, even if your customer 
on a remortgage has like the best in life insurance policy in the world, you still have to remind them of um, this and potentially assess whether there's any shortcomings from the new mortgage amount to their life insurance policy. And this is to ensure that you treat every single customer equally and fairly. And as you can imagine, any firm would really want to be seen uh, in a good light. They wouldn't want any reputational damage from complaints, and they certainly wouldn't want to be seen as an organization which has the most complaints. So if they follow the principle six of good business and act with the customer in their mind, then hopefully this would solve any potential future complaints. So what happens if a firm actually receives a complaint? Well, I said they've got eight weeks, um, so it covered the time scale, but what really should be done inside the firm is in their written policy, they should explain how they uh, come to some sort of complaint resolution. They must outline, as well as the time scales, how they deal with complaints, whose, whose role or department is it, how fair and impartial are this uh, department within the firm. And they should get all the facts. So if it's uh, a, an activity that was recorded, then of course they'll be listening to any sort of recorded phone calls or they'll be assessing any paperwork evidence during the process of whatever the complaint is about. Then when they've assessed the complaint, they need to decide to uphold it um, or reject it and then sort of any immediate uh, action and redress. Now we'll go through what the compensations limits are per policy but obviously businesses can go above and beyond um, for kind of improve their reputation and obviously as a gesture of goodwill due to the inconvenience of a customer going through the complaints process. But obviously this goodwill or going above and beyond the limits of compensation is purely um, from a customer relations point of view. And then lastly, if they obviously provide whether it's redress or they reject the complaint, then they must fully inform the customer um, about their decision, how they got to the decision to ensure that they went through a fair, clear and a non-misleading manner. What you may see uh, every half a year in the news is kind of a complaints league table, or you might see some uh, consumer websites producing articles about um, complaints league tables is probably what we'll call it. And that's effectively because in financial services, um, as part of the principles of good business customer interest, they have to report to regulators twice a year on the, the number of complaints, um, the types of complaints. So they'll have like the type of complaint and which department the complaint was to, and obviously the number of complaints. But as well as the kind of number of complaints, they must also demonstrate uh, the timely manner that they were dealt with. So were they all done very quickly within four weeks? or how many actually went on to the financial ombudsman service because it wasn't done within eight weeks. And then they also must account for the number of complaints that were upheld. Um, but also if they were um, rejected. And as well as this, they must produce a nominal fee amount, sorry, of how much they actually paid out in the form of redress. So all of this data has to be producing a report to the regulators and this is where then the media or the consumer um, independent websites then get a hold of this data to produce and compare and contrast the various financial services and again from a goodwill and PR point of view it's in the interests of the firm to obviously have as least complaints as possible uh, and if there are complaints to address them in a very timely manner in order for when they produce a report to the regulators and 
the media get a hold of it, it produces um, or gives the sense that this organisation is performing better when it comes to complaints. But having said that, these reports are quite universal and they do give a good sense for comparison purposes between organisations to make sure that the public are well informed on a fairly on a fair transparent process of which firms are better at dealing with complaints than others. So let's have a quick look at the compensation element now. So this slide briefly just shows who's eligible for compensation. Now we've already covered that. If you are an eligible complainant, which was said before, it's mainly all customers and small businesses, then you are also eligible to go and get compensation from any upheld complaint. And this compensation must be for a certain protected claim, which really means any kind of financial product that involves a depository institution or an investment um, business. So if you want to, to get the compensation, then the claim must be against a firm that is designated as an investment business or also be subject to the compensation deposit scheme. And then that also leads to point four, that it must be to a relevant person. Um, so when we covered the authorization of firms last week, then anyone that's authorized as a firm of financial services is, clear, is a relevant person. But remember, we talk about exemptions. So if you are doing a financial service, but on behalf of an organization overseas, then this may not be eligible for compensation because they'll be authorized, supervised by another jurisdiction. And then lastly, any complaint and compensation must be do must be conducted in a relevant time scale. And in the UK at the moment, that is classed as six years. So if you quickly look at the limits, now this is something that you won't exactly be tested on, but it's also useful just for your personal knowledge, whether you actually make a complaint in the, in the future. And on here, you can see the limits. You'll see a nominal limit, i.e. pounds and pence, and you'll see a percentage. So if we look at the top one, for instance, if you're making a complaint against a protected insurance or home finance product, then the upper limit is nominal at £50,000. So if you turn that into percentage, then that's 100% of the first 50000 But you couldn't claim and get compensation for any more than that. The protected deposit insurance, we mentioned this prior, previously, and that's set at €100,000 from EU regulation. In the UK, that currently translates to £85,000. So you are, if the infirm goes bust, uh, bankruptcy, then your deposits are protected up to the, the first 100% of this uh, nominal, nominal amount, but no more. If you're making a complaint against the likes of a long-term insurance policy, so the likes of uh, life insurance or critical illness policies, then your complaint and compensation can be up to 100% of the actual claim you're making. So if your life insurance policy is for £120,000, then there's no upper nominal limit. So that means you'll get the 100% of this 125000 claim. If your life insurance policy is only 50000 then you'd get 100% of 50000 So it doesn't matter if your claim is for a million, because that's what your policy is, or if it's £10 you can get the full amount nominal of the complaint. But like like some general insurance, so you say mobile phone insurance would be kind of 90%. So if your insurance policy for your mobile covers you up to a thousand pound, then the most compensation you could claim would be 900 pound. So that's 90% of the nominal value. Um, but it will say compulsory insurance, so the likes of compulsory insurance would be 
um, housing insurance, uh, build buildings, um, not building, not not content insurance, but building insurance for a mortgage property that's compulsory by law. So if you want to make a complaint against a building insurance policy, you get 100% of whatever the value is. So when I say there's no upper limit, that really refers to it can to nominal value. If your insurance policy is worth ten million pound, then you can claim up to ten million pound on a, with the hundred percent claim. If it's worth ten pound, then the maximum complaint is up to ten pound. So that's what we mean by uh, no upper limit. But like I said you wouldn't get tested on this, but it's all it's always worth knowing from a consumer point of view. And to finish off this lecture, we're going to go through the whistleblowing process. Now, first of all, I want you to look at this advertisement I've seen from the US. And this is from a legal provider, I'll say. And I thought this was quite a horrible advert. Um, one, because I believe it's quite oversimplifying things. Two, because it's quite sexist in nature. And free because the whistleblowing process in the US is very different to the UK. So in the US, as a whistleblower, you can actually do it for financial reward for yourself. So if you notice something criminal or wrong with inside the firm you work for, then you can actually go through a legal whistleblowing process, um, which is actually a legal case against your own employer. Um, and Obviously, the idea is that you'll stop whatever this crime may be, but there may be a financial incentive for you to do that. As you can see at the bottom there, it says the courts award millions of dollars to whistleblowers every year. But obviously, the cons being that you could actually get sacked um, or silenced is another way of looking at it. And if your whistleblowing is not successful, then you can imagine what that leaves the rest of your employment looking like. But this is from a US point of view, which is very legal based. And I think this is quite appalling because it's very different to the UK uh, way of whistleblowing. Because in the UK, the whistleblowing process is there to regulate requirements of firms uh, and that are regulated by the FCA have to have a process in where an employee can make a protected disclosure. So that's crucial, that what then was a protected disclosure. So if you work within an authorised financial firm and you notice some sort of criminal offence, miscarriage of justice, breach of health and safety, and that sort of thing, as you can see from the slide, you as an employee can whistleblow. And you must do this, not for financial gain. There's no financial gain for this as a whistleblower. You're doing it for, your, for providing a good faith um, and, up, and upholding your own ethical ethics and integrity. So you can't do this for any personal gain other than you're doing it in good faith and showing good integrity. And because it's classed as a protected disclosure, the word protected means that any whistleblower is protected under law from any sort of sanction from the firm. So what do we mean by that? Well, a firm cannot prevent an employee from making such a disclosure. So if they try to silence a whistleblower, then this is actually against the law. If your whistleblower and then you face any sort of discrimination in the workplace, or if all of a sudden you feel that you've not been given the opportunity to get promoted, or you withheld from any sort of your activities because of whistleblowing in the past, this is actually a serious matter. And if you want to raise this again, this has real bad consequences for the firm. And it's even worth noting that these rules, even though they are under the statutory enforcement of the FCA. If you're an authorised firm regulated by the FCA, if this activity happens without, outside the UK, it is still under the authority of the FCA if it's within that firm. So when I say this is a serious matter, if 
any firm was to discriminate against a whistleblower, then what is the ultimate sanction? Well, actually, in the UK, the FCA treated it extremely seriously. And if there was ever a detailed case of this, then the FCA have the power to remove the license to operate from this firm. So, as you can imagine, a firm wouldn't want to obviously provide any discrimination against an employee because if they do, the ultimate end goal would be the business uh, not being authorised to provide financial services. But obviously that's the extreme case. There is a process uh, of if, if an employee was to feel discriminated against, then they could obviously complain to the FCA about this, discuss their case, and then in the first instance, if found guilty, then the FCA could put, put appropriate sanctions, um, which would probably be fines for the firm, but also provide or ensure the firm provides suitable redress and compensation to the whistleblower that he discriminated against. But obviously, if this was done on a systemic, systemic nature, then of course the FCA have the power to remove the license to operate. So whistleblowing in the financial services is a serious uh, matter if the firm really discriminates against any whistleblower and is very different to the US system. And as I noted before, the complaint from the employee is not doing it for personal gain, they're doing it to uphold the principles of good business and to act in their own integrity, which is required under the approved person's uh, free tier system. And thank you for listening to this uh, presentation. If you want more information on the requirements of how firms can look to resolve any sort of complaint or dispute, you can have a look at the FCA handbook for this. I'd also direct you to the Financial Ombudsman Services website and this gives again a detailed uh, layout of the complaints process in the UK and gives you pretty much good, good consumer advice if you ever find yourself in a place where you need to make a sort of financial complaint. And then lastly from an economic, sorry, from an academic point of view, we have a paper here that's attached on Blackboard which talks about the various aspects um, of selling of financial services products. Thank you very much for listening.